Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here with us on this, uh, I guess it's not really raining anymore, but the rainy evening. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight to our midweek meeting. Uh, tonight we'll have uh, this class uh, lesson time, uh, and then we'll break and, and after a little while, and people downstairs will come up and join us for a time of singing <clears throat> and a devotional. Uh, so we thank you so much for being here tonight. We are going to be continuing our, uh, our summer series, our uh, not summer series, summer series. If you are annoyed at hearing me say that, you know, you're listening. Good job. Um, we're, we're continuing our talk through our unashamed theme for the summer, talking about different examples of ashamed and unashamed people in the scriptures. If you have your Bible with you tonight, grab that and turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm not going to do it for the sake of time tonight, but I, I do believe that if we were to poll the audience uh, tonight to ask for biblical examples of people who uh, are examples of faith and courage and strength in Scripture, one of the most prominent names that would probably come up is a guy named David, or we know him as King David. David is someone who we often categorize as a hero of the Bible, a hero of the Scriptures. Uh, and we, we do so because of his, because of a lot of things, because of a lot of the different things that he did in his life, that he maintained in his life. Um, we, we have record of almost every step of King David's adult life after he was anointed king up until his death in the scriptures. And we have uh, not just his successes recorded for us, but also his failures, his uh, very great failures. Uh, still, he, he is someone from the history of our faith that many of us uh, would still say as a whole he lived an unashamed life, that he lived a life of faith, and he's an example of strength in many instances in more ways than one. Later in life, uh, he was an accomplished king and a warrior, uh, so much so that the people of Israel had a song that was like taunting uh, how many people that David had killed in battle versus how many people that, uh, that King Saul had killed in battle, kind of a strange thing uh, to celebrate as a nation. Um, but he was an accomplished king and warrior, uh, and, but we also have his, his incredibly big mistakes recorded for us in Scripture. And even still, we, we can still consider him someone who had great strength and resolve as a person and as a follower of God. We often use the, the, the word faith or the concept of faith, uh, and, and we, we use a word to measure faith. We use the word strength and weakness. Strength, uh, strength and weakness. Somebody has a strong faith, is very resolved in their faith, very resolved in their belief, and somebody has a weak faith would be the opposite of that, obviously. Uh, it's, it's kind of the same way that we've been using ashamed and unashamed uh, during this summer series, uh, talking about different uh, people's faith and how they interacted with who God is. An unashamed faith is a faith that can stand up to scrutiny and difficulty and remain strong in difficult situations. As humans, uh, and maybe more so as, I'm not sure if it's one or the other, as humans, maybe even more so as Americans, uh, many of us have a desire that is built within us uh, to, to be strong, to be self-sufficient people. Uh, we, we don't like to ask for help much. Kind of the American dream is you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and do things on your own. But this kind of thinking is carried into our Christian lives where we say to ourselves and to one another that we have to be strong-faced Christians and that it's up to us to do what needs to be done to have an unashamed faith. And this is true in a sense. But how we get there, I believe, is a little counterintuitive, maybe a little paradoxical. But I believe that it is a better way that we're going we're to be talking about tonight. As we continue this theme of ashamed, unashamed faith, and what we, what we mean by saying that we need to have a strong faith, I want to bring to question our underlying assumption that we are supposed to be strong, independent, self-sufficient Christians. Again, whether we get this from simply being human or whether we get this from our more Americanized context, I'm unsure. However, this idea of self-sufficiency and, and trying to be a strong, independent person, uh, it, it, it enters into our reading of Scripture. We, we tend to import it into our reading of Scripture, and it can have a very negative impact on how we view the story of God as a whole. So tonight we're going to be talking about somewhat of a paradox of what it means to have 
a strong, unashamed faith. And we're going to do so by looking at the story of David and Goliath. If you're already there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, you probably already saw that in a heading if your Bible has headings. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, if you're not there, please turn there. When we come to the story of David and Goliath in, in chapter 17, what comes before that is obviously chapter 16. That kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Um, in chapter 16, we, we find out some very important things about David. Namely, this is really the first time we meet David. Uh, he's this young shepherd boy, uh, the son of a guy named Jesse. And in chapter 16, uh, this guy named Samuel goes to Jesse's household because he's trying to find a new king. King Saul has basically been deposed. He's still, as, he's still acting as king, but, but God has tasked Samuel to, to select a new king or to anoint a new king. David is by no means the top choice, uh, and, and this isn't a surprise to you. I know that many of us probably are very familiar with this story in some ways. David was by no means the, the top choice. Uh, Jesse had all of his sons kind of pass before Samuel to see if God would select them as the king. And one by one, these brothers who are, who are warriors, they're, they're older than David, they're, they're a bit uh, more kingly looking than David, it seems, um, and God rejects each one of them as they come by. And it's to the point at the end where it appears like there's no more sons. And so uh, Samuel asks Jesse, Are, do you have another? And he kind of like hesitates and he's like, yeah, you know, there, there, there is another one, but he's the shepherd. Like he's the kid out in the field. He's the guy that we leave with the livestock. Probably not the kingly kind of character. But when David shows up, God immediately tells Samuel, this is him. And uh, Samuel takes a, a horn of oil and anoints, uh, anoints David, the next king, which the anointing part might sound a little weird to us that you pour oil on somebody's head and say, like, you're in charge. Uh, we kind of do something similar to that uh, in, in our context with, like, football and, like, what do you do after, like, the, the coach wins the game? You, you dunk them with the big, you know, thing of Gatorade. Kind of a, same, a similar idea, obviously quite different because it's oil, not Gatorade. Um, when we come to chapter 17... It appears as though quite a bit of time has passed between those chapters, between chapter 16 and 17, because when we come to chapter 17, we see the army of Israel on one hill and the Philistines, the Philistine army on another hill, and there's a valley in between, and there's some interesting things going on in this place. Three of David's older brothers are already there at the battle, serving as warriors in this battle, and this is where we come to the bulk of our story. If you're there in 1 Samuel Chapter 17, look at verses 4 through 11. It's on the screen, but you could follow along. It may be kind of small on the screen. Oh, it's a little bigger. That's cool. All right, starting in verse 4. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I probably sound like a broken record when I'm going to say this, but I really wish that we could read this for the first time again. Because we're so familiar. We're so familiar that like this doesn't seem weird to us. This doesn't seem like a shock to us at all. We're not really amazed with this anymore. The Philistines have this champion named Goliath, and he's described as being six cubits and a span in our uh, typical way of measuring around nine foot nine. That's a tall dude. He's kind of huge. The tallest man alive today uh, lives in Turkey. He's a farmer, and he is just shy of eight foot three inches. And Goliath is almost a foot and a half taller than described as almost a foot and a half taller than the tallest person alive today. He has a bronze helmet and chain mail that weighed more than 100 pounds, bronze armor, and he had a shield. I don't know if you saw this detail. He had a shield that required another human being to carry it. 
That's how big and heavy it was. He had a shield bearer. The business end of his flagpole of a spear weighed somewhere around 15 pounds. Um, Goliath was a massive human being, and he was not a sideshow act. He was a trained warrior. He was somebody who grew up uh, basically groomed for fighting and killing and, uh, and making sure that no one could defeat the Philistines. So Goliath went out ahead of his people and shouted for Israel to send someone out to challenge him. He put a bounty on his challenge saying that whoever loses, and by loses you should read whoever dies, whoever loses this challenge, that one's people will be the servants of the winner. In verse 11 we read this, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. What a disappointing fact to hear about the army of Israel, though it's understandable. This is the same nation that 300 years earlier faced Jericho, not with swords and spears, but with trumpets and marching around the city. And God took that city for them, collapsed the walls, and they went in and took over. There were so many other events in Israel's history where where they came up against these impossible situations, and God came through every time. But now there's one guy who's a little tall. He is genuinely tall. There's one guy, and the entire army is just terrified. They, they don't think that they can handle it. I, I'm not saying that I would not be scared. I'm, I'm pretty confident that I would be, and I, I'm pretty confident that all of us would be. And that's an important fact that we'll visit a little bit later uh, tonight. For 40 days, Goliath comes out and says the same thing, challenging Israel to send forth a competitor that can equal his might. Summarizing uh, verses 12 through 30, we're going to skip just a little bit. We see that David's three brothers are there with King Saul and the rest of the army, but David had to to travel back and forth if he was going to be at the, the battle line because, again, he was the shepherd. He had to take care of the sheep. So David's at home uh, with his dad, Jesse, and Jesse sends David back to the battle line to do two things. Number one, he was going to take his older brothers and the other soldiers there uh, some food so that they had provisions. And number two, Jesse sent him so that he would bring back a report of whether or not his sons were okay, how how the battle was going, how, how they were faring in it. But when David arrived, he saw and he heard Goliath for the first time. And as Goliath made his challenge, David sees what's going on. He sees the, the, the army cower in the corner. And this is not in the text, but given what comes next, I can only imagine that David is probably a bit disappointed in what he's seeing with Israel's army. As the army backs down, he hears talk that whoever challenges this champion, that the king is planning to reward that person. He's going to give him reward and, and that, that person will be able to marry the king's daughter. So David makes sure that he heard them correctly. He actually goes around talking to people, did I hear this right? Is this really what's going on? Is there really a challenge on the table? Is there really a reward? And one of David's brothers, Eliab, he he comes up to David. He overheard David asking about the situation. And he basically tells David, hey, you need to, like, you really need to be quiet and you need to just go back to the sheep. That's where you belong. You're, You're not a warrior. You're not supposed to be here. But word about what David had been saying reached King Saul. And so Saul called David to come and talk with him. And that's where we pick up if you're following along in verse, in verse 31. We'll read verses 31 through 37. 31 through 37. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Are you not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him? For you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear I took a lamb and and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. If he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. When David tells Saul that he's going to go out and challenge Goliath, Saul has the same kind of response that Eliab had. You're really not fit for this. This isn't your wheelhouse. You need to probably go back to the sheep. Uh, he's a giant. There's absolutely no, no way I'm going to send you out there. Saul is not being unreasonable, okay? Just on like a human perspective. Saul is not being unreasonable by, by telling David that's a bad idea. In fact, based on the bare facts, he's being uh, reasonable and kind of kind to him. Uh, if you know the stories of Saul and, and David as they go on, they kind of become somewhat of enemies at a, at a point. So Saul is being kind to him at this point. But David tells Saul what the life of a shepherd really looks like. David, he says he made an occasional practice of killing bears and lions with his bare hands in defense of his sheep. He may be young, but he doesn't sound at all like the little scrawny kid that like we see in like the kid's coloring storybooks for Bibles. You know what I'm talking about? Like he's this little boy. We'll talk about his weapon in a little bit, but he's this, he's this kind of scrawny little kid. But before the, we go the other direction, we need to also realize that although David's probably not a scrawny kid and has apparently done some pretty intense things as a shepherd, he's also likely not in the running for a strongman competition. The point of this, the fact that David's young, the fact that he's ill-equipped for this job the point is that David is not the perfect man built for the job. That's what we should all recognize. He's not the person that we would assume is the one that's going to take down this giant. He's confident, but I want you to take notice of the difference of his confidence. Look back at verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, go and the Lord be with you. David attributes his ability to take on bears and lions and eventually Goliath in this situation. He attributes that not to himself and his own ability, although he does talk about it. Namely, he attributes his ability to God's presence in everything that he does in his life. God's spirit has been with him since he was anointed in chapter 16. Again, we said that like probably a, a bit of time has passed between then and now. David's not actually stepping up because he thinks that he can handle it. David's stepping up to this, this task because he trusts that God can handle it and he sees that the army has lost their trust. And now that David has said this about God, Saul can't deny David the opportunity to go against Goliath because if he did, he would be admitting that he has a weak faith. He'd be, he'd be admitting, I don't have the kind of faith in God that you do, David. David. In the end, Saul tells David, go and the Lord be with you. And in verses 38 through 40, Saul gives David his armor and his shield and all the things that, that Saul would have originally taken in to battle himself. But David ultimately refuses it personally. He says, it's really not for me. It's not, it's not fit for me. I haven't tested it. Uh, so I don't really want to, to take this into battle. So David, instead, he, he just takes himself and takes a staff and a sling and how many smooth stones? Do y'all know? Five, five, yes. Five smooth stones. Then in verses 41 through 44, David moves out to the battlefield to challenge Goliath. And when Goliath comes to meet him, if you look in that section 41 through 44, when Goliath comes to meet him, Goliath is offended because he notices that basically a kid's coming out to fight him. He's offended because he feels that he's more worthy of a better and bigger opponent in this challenge. And Goliath says to David, am I a dog that you're coming at me with sticks? And then he called on the Philistine gods to curse David. Look with me in verses 45 through 47. We're going to read that next, 45 through 47. Then David said to the Philistine, this is after Goliath spoke to David. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. To this day, or excuse me, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, but 
for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. David talks back at Goliath, but he doesn't make a display of his own strength at all. That's not even a part of his defense. He doesn't say, my my five smooth smooth stones and my sling are going to take you down. What does he say? He says, he simply appeals to the strength of the Lord. He says, I know that God's going to do this. I know that God's on our side and I know that God will take care of you. David is largely unconcerned with his own performance in this matter. I don't know if you noticed that. He's largely unconcerned with like, what am I going to really do with the stones and all that kind of stuff? In the end, in verses 46 and 47 of what we read, David tells Goliath exactly why he's coming out to take him down. He says, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And then you likely know what happens next. Let's read it anyway, starting in verse 48, ending with 51. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. David had five stones. How many did it take to take Goliath down? Just one, not five. He didn't have, he didn't have to grab back into his bag. Many people think of David's sling, unfortunately. I think this is also because of the cartoon pictures that we color. A lot of people think of his sling as like a toy slingshot that you would give a kid for like Christmas. This sling, not, not so much a slingshot, but this sling was, was a legitimate weapon that was used by, by a lot of different cultures in this time. And it was an incredibly accurate and deadly weapon. You would typically, like when you think of stones, you're probably thinking like little pebbles. Probably would have been a little bit more substantial that they would have been throwing with this, uh, with this sling. It was an incredibly accurate weapon. And David probably had personal experience with it as a shepherd. It's, it's most likely the, the weapon that he would use if he was too far away to defend the sheep, if he couldn't grab the thing by its beard like he said he did. Um, he probably would have grabbed the sling and, and slung a rock at a bear or at a lion. So the stone that, that David slings, it sinks into Goliath's forehead and Goliath goes down. And then David runs over to Goliath's body Uh, We don't really know if he was fully dead or not or if he was just dazed. And David grabs Goliath's sword and he cuts the giant's head off. Uh, This is usually a part of the story that we leave out of the children's curriculum when we teach it, right? We don't. And then we leave out especially what comes after because David actually takes the giant's head and like parades it around the city as like a celebration. We usually leave that out. I I was actually at a VBS the first year that I was here and we actually played that out in a skit. So I was kind of, Proud, but also like, ooh, you know, strange. And so the story in summation, a story that most of us are familiar with, whether you grew up in church or not, this, this is just a, a, a very well-known story of like little guy defeats big guy, right? That's kind of the, the way that we sum it up. The summation is that this man, David, a young man, newly anointed king, an unlikely champion, stepped up to the line of battle and took down the biggest of the Philistines with one rock and his own sword. And he did so... According to the text, not on his own strength or resolve, but because he trusted the Lord to come through. This is an incredible story. And I don't use the word story in the sense that, oh, this is like a good make-believe tale that we can create um, moral lessons out of and and a tale about courage and bravery and things like that. This actually happened. This This is like a book of history. This is a historical record of something that happened during the early days of the kingdom of Israel. So why tonight, why did we spend the bulk of our time rehashing a story that many of us already know and have probably, if you grew up in a round church, you've heard this countless times, been through all the VBSs, seen all the skits, seen all the puppet shows, all that kind of stuff. 
Number one, uh, really kind of a simple reason, because this is God's word and it's good for us to continually revisit his word and familiar stories so that we can get kind of a better grasp of what was really going on. But also number two, and, and kind of the main point, because I want to discuss something that we tend to bring into this story and many like it. And in that, I want to point us toward a better way of reading the Bible as a whole. And ultimately, this will point us toward a better way of understanding what it really means to be unashamed and to have a strong, unashamed faith. When this story is taught, it's often taught from a particular point of view and it manifests itself in a few different ways. When we read and teach the story of David and Goliath, And many biblical stories like it, we teach that the way to understand this story's relevance to us today is to put ourselves in the place of the hero of the story. So with David and Goliath, we often teach that you need to go and be like David. You need to go be strong like David, be unashamed like David. So we identify ourselves with David as the who we are in the story And then we make Goliath to be the representative of all of our big problems, all of our big struggles in life. And the charge of the story is that you need to be like David, so go out, pick up your five smooth stones, which sometimes has turned into a five-point lesson of like techniques to defeat sin, even though David only needed one, and then to go out and defeat your giants. If you have been a Christian for more than a few years, I would bet that this is an approach you've likely heard It's an approach that I've taught personally because I don't think that it is completely wrong. However, I want to show us a different way of looking at it. I think it's it's okay to apply this text in this way. It's a good thing to teach people to imitate uh, people from Scripture that that had a resolve of faith and and trusted and followed God, and we should not stop doing that. But one of the confusing possibilities that we can come to in a story like this, and this is just one of, of many confusing possibilities, is when we tell people that they need to be like David, we kind of have to ask, which David? Because there's like the David of this story, and he does some cool stuff, right? But then there's also the other David, who is the same guy, who committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed because he was nervous about the ramifications of her having a child. This is the same guy. Yes, David was a man after God's own heart, but he was also a deeply flawed man just like all of us. So to emulate him, we have to kind of eat the meat and spit out the bones, as we say. But I believe, and it can only go so far, but I believe that there is a better way to go about this way of reading scripture. There are two larger ways that we can read the Bible that kind of help us to inform how we're understanding scripture. The two bigger ways is like a human-centered view versus a God-centered view. We can read the Bible from a human-centered point of view or from a God-centered point of view. And the human-centered point of view is the typical way in which we present this story and others in Scripture. So we read these kinds of accounts from the Bible. We identify the hero of the story. We make ourselves to be that hero. And it's kind of interesting that we almost never apply ourselves to and asking ourselves, are we the villain? Could it be that we're not the one who does the great thing? Could it be that we identify more with someone else in the story? We tend to always identify ourselves as the hero and then without realizing it, we make the point of the story about us rather than about what was intended to be communicated. And in turn, we make the Bible out to be a book primarily about us. And it falls short and it leaves a lot of disappointment and confusion. It leads to disappointment because the Bible in truth isn't primarily about us and we were never meant to be the real hero of the story. The God-centered view of the Bible, the opposite way to read this, reads the Bible as a book that is primarily about God and what God did and has done and is doing and will do in the future in and for his creation. And if we learn to read the Bible with a God-centered view, what we will constantly begin to notice is that contrary to what we may have thought, God is always the hero in every account of scripture, no matter what. God is the one who's strong and unashamed. God is the one who's making the moves. And when something fails, it's not a failure on God's part. It is because usually the people in the story begin to think that whatever's going on depends on them and they forget about God. And then whenever things go bad, sometimes tend to blame God, where'd you go? Whenever they left him in the first place. On this reading of the story, the real hero in David and Goliath is God. God is. 
is the hero. David is strong, but it's not his strength that, that he ascribes the victory to throughout the whole of the account. It is God's strength. Yes, David represents a certain kind of strength, that kind of counterintuitive way, but it's a strength that recognizes that God is the only one who's truly, who can truly do what everyone else is afraid to do. Look back with me in a few places from the account and you'll see what I mean. In verse 26, it's written, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine, this is David speaking, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David recognized that the threat that Goliath was bringing was not really against Saul and it was not really against the army, but it was against God himself. In verse 37, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David recognizes that he is not the source of his protection and ability and that God himself is going to be the one that will deliver him from Goliath. And in verses 45 through 47, the text says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you with a stack of rocks. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I come to you with a stack of rocks or a stack of techniques to defeat sin. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, your head for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. David recognizes that the weapon that he brings into battle is mostly insignificant. And he establishes to Goliath that it will be the Lord that strikes him down because the battle is not David's to win, but it is the Lord's. He's not just, he's not just using spiritualized language talking about that God is going to do this. He actually trusts that God, like the people that went to Jericho, like the people who followed God, those hundreds of years ago in their history did. He actually believed that God was going to come through. I think more accurately, when, when we look at this story, our counterpart in the story is not David, not usually, but more so the army, the people who said we can't do it, the people who are cowering in the corner because we're usually too concerned with our own strength to realize that we don't win with our strength but with God's. We're talking about the importance of living an unashamed life here tonight and for, the, for this year, but I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian. I can't tell you to be unashamed like David tonight because we're not and we do not have the ability to be unashamed and strong on our own. We are weak, we are feeble, we stumble into sin often, and we cannot white knuckle our way into strong, unashamed faith. We're not built like that. We cannot be strong and unashamed on our own, but with God, we actually can. I believe that's the point of this story, at least one of the ways that we can understand it. So often, because we want to appear stronger and more resolved than we really are, we try to do everything on our own steam. And we do so to our own detriment. If our message from this story, if our primary message is now go home and be good like David, we turn this story into more of a burden to bear rather than the good news of God's work that it's supposed to be. Because when you try to conquer your giants with your own strength and you fail, then so many walk away wondering why this Christianity thing doesn't work for them because their trust was misplaced. A human-centered view of the scriptures will always result in a self-driven faith, a self-driven Christianity that is largely devoid of the strength of God. God is strong, and we are not. And that is a good thing because through himself and his strength, he makes us unashamed. And that's where the power comes from. When we read the story of David and Goliath from a God-centered view, we're able to see the bigger picture of what this account says about God. And we're able to see how this account fits in the overarching narrative of the whole Bible as a story. Ultimately, this is not a story. It's not just a story about a young shepherd killing a giant with a rock. It is, of course, that, that, that is, it is historical fact. But it's also part of a bigger story that can be traced through all of Scripture where God uses unlikely means to accomplish his overarching purposes. He always does it that way. He always uses the person that is not supposed to be able to do it in order to actually accomplish, or at least the person that people think can't accomplish. Part of the bigger story of God, 
is that the story of David and Goliath actually can point us to Jesus in a unique way. Jesus of Nazareth, whether you know this or not, uh, we learn this in the Gospels in the book of Acts. They, uh, the, the, the earliest uh, preachers in the book of Acts spoke a lot about this, that Jesus is a descendant of David, a physical descendant of David, and he is so by design. Many places in the Old Covenant scriptures, the Messiah is prophesied to be from the kingly lineage of David. That's where he's going to come from. We need to see David as what he truly is in the larger narrative story of God. And that's that David is a type of Christ or a picture of Christ. I don't know if you've ever explored or studied typology or what's sometimes called shadows uh, from the Old Testament. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul writes about how many things in the Old Testament are meant to be pictures and things that point us toward the reality of Jesus when he does come. Like how uh, Jesus is connected with the Passover lamb, that the Passover lamb was actually this symbol long before Jesus came of what Jesus would fulfill later on. Because Jesus, like the Passover lamb, the function of the Passover lamb in the Passover, it brought about this deliverance from bondage to sin, bondage to slavery in Egypt, but Jesus brings freedom from bondage to sin. Well, David is also a type or a shadow of Christ. And rightfully so, because Jesus is his descendant, and this is part of the design of the whole story. The story of David and Goliath actually maps onto the story of Jesus in a pretty interesting and cool way. And there's a lot of different details. I'm not going to cover all of them. But as the people of God, we have an enemy, and we call that enemy Satan. Satan is a powerful, created being who, who rebelled against God and who is in rebellion against God. And Satan cannot be overcome by mere humanity. Satan is very real and very genuinely powerful. God correspond, or excuse me, Goliath in the story corresponds to Satan in that he is someone who defies God and his people willingly and wants to destroy them. Goliath defies the armies of Israel, or as David puts it, the armies of the living God. And none of the soldiers dared to try and stop him because alone they couldn't. But David enters the scene in full obedience to God, having been anointed as the next king. And no one thought that David fit the part. But he was filled with God's spirit, and he tells King Saul, I'm going to go after Goliath, not with my own strength, but with the strength that God gives. And God, through David, takes out Goliath with one shot. But the story doesn't end there. It's not just the one shot and done. David goes to the fallen Goliath and delivers the death blow, not with another stone, but with a sword. But again, not his own sword, but a sword taken from the sheath of his enemy. The main weapon of sin, the main weapon that Satan uses against humanity, is death, which began because of sin as a consequence of disobedience. But when Jesus goes to the cross and dies to secure salvation from sin for all humanity, how does he do it? By dying, but then by conquering death. Some have said, some have described the crucifixion as the day that sin killed itself. Because just as David used the enemy's own weapon to defeat the enemy, Jesus used death to defeat that original enemy. David's conquering of Goliath is a picture of Jesus' conquering of Satan. And that's why I say that we are more accurately identified with the scared soldiers cowering in the corner, scared to death of the giant who is challenging Israel. I don't say that to demean us and make us feel bad about ourselves, but it is to put ourselves in our proper place in the story so that God can be the rightful hero as we see him. Because after God handled the enemy, after God handled Goliath, you know what happened to the army? They shared in the victory. They shared in the victory of the defeat of the enemy. And it's so that we can say, when we think about Jesus, I'm not strong, but my God is, and I'm unashamed of him because I know that he actually fought the battle for me. Not because of my goodness and strength, but because of his, and because he has conquered, I have conquered with him. Should we be unashamed? Absolutely. But we are able to be unashamed because Jesus has victoriously conquered the enemy for us. And that is good news. And we should be unashamed because of that good news, not because of our personal strength, because our strength is found in God alone. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. Uh, people will be coming up pretty soon. I think the bells were supposed to ring, but they did not.
So 